Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rosemary Scanlon, although I think, I think I've already been introduced. And I am the divisional dean of the Schack Institute of Real Estate, which is part of the big school of, uh, of, of professional studies here at NYU. So on behalf of the School of Professional Studies, I want to welcome you this afternoon. This is today's conference is called On Ramps of Opportunity, Building a Creative and Inclusive New York. Wonderful topic. Uh, for those of you in person, it is a pleasure to see you here today. And for joining us, and for those of you who are, will join us by live stream, we welcome you and hope you can stay with us all afternoon. Um, today's conference is being created by the new initiative for creativity and innovation in cities, sponsored by the, the School of Professional Studies here at MIU, and you'll hear more about that as the conference proceeds today. So we have a terrific program. Uh, it, what, the, one of the big questions that we're asking is, is New York City creating a new leading edge and creative edge? How do we build a vibrant New York and an inclusive New York that's also creative? We, we need to, we're going to ask, is it time for a new economic development approach? One that rebuilds New York City's economy from the ground up and one that takes advantage of New York's greatest strength, which is its innate creativity and also its creative people. How do we build on ramps of opportunity? And the on ramps that will allow every New Yorker from every neighborhood the chance to come to, to the whole city economy, to be part of the creative economy. These are just a few of the questions we're going to ask today with New York City's controller Scott Stringer and with Richard Florida, who is global research professor here at New York University. And we will also have, as they will lead us through, a panel of distinguished thinkers, trendsetters, and media personalities. So we'll begin today's conference with Comptroller Stringer, and he will talk about building the on-ramps on the pathway to prosperity. And that will be followed by an address by Professor Richard Florida on New York City, new, creative, and inclusive. Uh, following the keynotes, we will have two most interesting panel discussions. One, the first one, New York uh, One, Channel One's Errol Lewis, will moderate a discussion on maintaining New York City's creative edge. And Manoush Zamordi, managing director and host of WNYC's New Tech City, will lead a discussion on the creating pathways to the New York City economy. So for those of you also who want to engage in the afternoon's conference via Twitter, we are live tweeting. I think it should be on your program, but it's hashtag OnRampsNYC. Now we expect almost as many tweets as they got for the World Cup. So, so I now have the pleasure of introducing to you New York City Comptroller Scott Stringer. Comptroller Stringer has dedicated his, public, his career to public service and in building a strong middle class for New York City. He's focused on New York City's fiscal health and issues that affect working people, including affordable housing and budget reform. Uh, Mr. Stringer was elected to the New York State Assembly in 1992, representing Manhattan's Upper West Side, and he, he, where he served for 13 years. And he won election in 2006 as Manhattan Borough President, where he served two terms. He was elected as controller in the last election in November 2013. In his first six months in office, uh, Comptroller Stringer has commissioned audits to cut waste and abuse in government. He's tackled areas like public school overcrowding and the New York City Housing Authority. He has created a Sandy Oversight Unit to investigate how federal money is being spent and to find ways to improve results for taxpayers and monitor the recovery process. He has recently released a study that found that New York City's median rent had grown 75% from 2000 to 2012, 
compared to a 47% gain for the rest of the nation, with the harshest consequences, of course, being felt by low-income families. As a longtime advocate for the arts, Comptroller Stringer has authored a report where he revealed that 28% of New York City's public schools had no full-time certified art teachers, and with the biggest cuts having been made in the city's poorest school districts. So he, this report of his led to a $23 million increase in arts education funding, which includes a commitment by New York City's Department of Education to hire 120 additional certified full-time arts teachers. Most recently, he has also reimagined his office with new innovative ideas like CleanStat, he calls it CleanStat, excuse me, a data-driven tool designed to drive down the cost of settlements and judgments and by empowering the city's agencies to reduce claims through changes in training or resource delivery. These are areas of the city that cost New York City enormous amounts of money. Mr. Stringer was born and raised in Washington Heights where he attended local and public schools. And he's a graduate of the John Jay School of Criminal Justice. He and his wife, Elise, live with their two sons, Maxwell and Miles, on Manhattan's Upper West Side. So please join me in welcoming New York City Scott Stringer to the stage. Thank you very much. No, you <laughs> well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm very excited to have all of you here. I want to start out by thanking Dean Scanlon for that very generous and inclusive introduction. And I want to thank to all of you for coming today to share ideas about how we can build a more expansive and inclusive economy for our city. Creating a city of shared prosperity is going to require all hands on deck. We need academics, business leaders, elected officials, labor leaders, and community advocates to pull it all together. And that's why all of you are here today, to envision this future and chart a path to reach it. We won't do it by looking backward to the economies of yesterday. Instead, we need to build what we're calling on-ramps of opportunity to the jobs of tomorrow. Ever since this city was founded, there has been a tension between those who cling to the status quo and the visionaries who, re who reimagine a new economy. We saw it in the 18th century with turf wars between agriculture and the newly emerging port, in the 19th century between the port and a growing manufacturing sector, and in the 20th between factories and the economies of finance, insurance, and real estate. We're having the same conversation today. New York faces a choice between holding on to the past or building a more dynamic economic future in the age of fiber optics. Other cities may cling to a particular industry out of sheer necessity, but New York is where it all comes together. As E.B. White wrote 65 years ago, New York is the concentrate of art and commerce and sport and religion and entertainment and finance. New York, he said, brings together the gladiator, the evangelist, the promoter, the actor, the trader, and the merchant. As a result, we have always been a city of reinvention. Today, we built an economy based on the creation and dissemination of ideas, and good ideas never go out of style. But neither do the economic challenges. The good news, and I can tell you this is controller, is that jobs here are growing faster than anywhere in the state. We have a record private sector employment, a booming tech economy, and real diversification of industry and expansion across all five boroughs. But at the same time, I think people feel this, too many New Yorkers have been left behind. Millions live paycheck to paycheck as opportunities for middle class jobs have eroded. Unemployment and poverty continues to devastate many of our neighborhoods. Many of the new jobs in this economy barely offer enough to pay the rent and put food on the table. And over 400,000 young people are either not in school or not employed. Now we can and must do better. New York must be a city that not only grows, but lifts up everybody in every neighborhood. 
And to do this, we need to reinvest in the on-ramps of opportunity in public schools and public transit and broadband and workforce development. We can start by focusing on physical and human infrastructure. From the Erie Canal to the Manhattan Grid, from the Brooklyn Bridge to our transit system, New York's physical investments have fuel, fueled its growth. But now this infrastructure is quickly becoming obsolete. For most of the 20th century, New York's telecommunication system was the greatest in the whole world. Today, we're heading into a digital stone age. Nearly three million New Yorkers lack internet access at home. Think about that. For those who can afford internet, you're part of the economy. And for those who can't, you're priced out. The internet is no longer a luxury. It's an essential component of modern life, a pathway to opportunity that educates students and is crucial to any job search. Our mass transit system must also adapt to the changing needs of a five borough economy. It leaves too many people too far away from new job opportunities, particularly low-income New Yorkers. A hundred years ago, it made sense to build a system that carried people from the boroughs to Manhattan and back. Today, the jobs landscape has changed. More people are living and working outside of Manhattan, but interborough transit remains slow and unreliable. We need to modernize our transit system and stay ahead of the curve. The same is true when it comes to human infrastructure. There is no greater on-ramp than education, both in our public schools and our other institutions of higher learning. But here, too, we've got some work to do. The achievement gap in New York City starts early and has ramifications for our entire economy. And this gap persists all the way up the workforce. Now, Google recently released their diversity scorecard, showing that 87% of their tech workers were men and 94% were white or Asian. We need to change this story, and the work starts at the grade school level. Today, there are 100 computer science teachers in our public schools. So let me put it another way. We're talking about one commu computer science teacher for every 11,000 students. Now, we know that students with computer skills are more likely to find middle-class jobs and hopefully put those skills to work for New York. So what are we doing and what are we waiting for? If we're serious about meeting the challenges of a future economy, we should be making computer science instruction available to all students. Instead, year after year, we're training our kids for yesterday's jobs. Now, I'm an optimist, but I have to tell you that all of this marks a troubling change for New York City because for the first time in our history, we risk looking backwards rather than forward, whether it's for inspiration or we risk underestimating the huge economic challenges transforming our city, and we risk clinging to the status quo instead of embracing the creativity that has made us the world's greatest city. Now, I realize there's nothing worse than elected officials reciting the same statistics about the same problems over and over and doing nothing. But I'm here to tell you that New York City doesn't have that luxury anymore. We can't pretend the future is somebody else's problem. My office recently released a disturbing study showing that the number of full-time arts instructors declined steeply in recent years. We found that 28% of our public schools don't have full-time art teachers. Now, these arts teachers impart skills that form the bedrock of our creative economy. So here's what we did. We identified the problem. And then we worked with the mayor and the city council. And in less than 90 days, less than 90 days after releasing this report, we got more than $23 million put into the budget to bring 120 new arts teachers into schools that didn't have them. Yes, in central Brooklyn, in the South Bronx. We did it fast, and we did it smart. Now, if we can put 120 arts teachers into the public school system in 90 days, we must be able to do it for computer science. We must. We have no more excuses. But let me just say that our work doesn't just end with public school. Here's what we must do. We need apprenticeship programs to create jobs and hope in communities that have been left out of the creative economy. We need to press Washington to beef up funding 
for these crucial job engines. And we need a workplace development plan that helps people in mid-career freshen their skills for today and tomorrow's jobs. Today, the door of opportunity remains closed for too many New Yorkers, and our future depends on unlocking it all for residents who can participate fully in this city's vibrant economy. Now, it's my hope that today's conference will be the beginning of a results-driven discussion in this city. This is not a bemoaning conference or sort of looking at the glass half full and saying, what are we going to do? We're outraged. This is about creating ideas and a template for actually getting things done. That is why this collaboration today is so important. We all want to identify the best ways to bring about long overdue challenges and recognize the challenges before us. We can create a dialogue that can change the landscape of our city to bring everybody along to a great place where we all want to see. So I have no doubt that the people in this room are here today because you want to roll up your sleeves and get down to business, and that's what we're going to do today. So I want to thank you all very much. I'm glad to see all of you here. And now, and now, I want to introduce our next speaker, our partner in this collaboration with NYU. I'd like to now present my co-partner and friend for this conference, Professor Richard Florida. Give him a big round of applause. Now, as an elected official, I've had the pleasure of introducing many, many, many distinguished speakers. But for Richard Florida, it's not enough to say that he's a global research professor at NYU. He's much more than that. In an earlier generation, we had voices like Jane Jacobs who illuminated the importance of American cities. Today, that voice belongs to Richard Florida, who understands better than anyone how cities will drive our future, not only in America, but around the world. His writings and commentaries have guided my thinking, first as borough president and now as controller. Richard is a visionary who understood the profound shifts of the creative economy long before anybody else. And he's mentoring the next generation of leaders who will confront these issues head on. He has always been willing to search and engage for the new issues facing us uh, as we head into the 21st, as we are in the 21st century. Now, I've been a huge fan of his for years. I'm glad that we finally have got him here in the world's greatest city, uh, working as an ep ep academic and visionary. It is really an honor and a great privilege to present to each and every one of you, Professor Richard Florida, our co-presenter at this conference. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, uh, th thank you so much, Scott, Controller uh, Stringer, for that very, very kind introduction and those incredibly inspiring and motivating words. Um, we both agree this is the beginning of a, of a conversation about the future of the world's greatest city and the future of the world's cities. And in a way, I take your, your challenge seriously. We, we are very much back in the situation that, that Jane Jacobs was a generation or more ago in the late 1950s when she was confronting the bulldozers and saving neighborhoods. We don't have to confront the bulldozers. Well, not that much anyway. Uh, we have to confront a much more powerful set of forces, a market and an economy that has recognized the true power of cities, and that is at once generating tremendous re-urbanization and economic potential because of the clustering of investment and talent and skills, but at the very same time dividing us in ways no one, no one would have thought possible. The same force that creates our urban renaissance, our economic revival, stimulates technology, simultaneously divides us. And, and the comptroller is right. We've had enough work bemoaning that. I'll talk more about that in a second. We've had enough work bemoaning that, but we have a very real task before us. And that is to keep the engine fire burning, keep the engines fire fueled, stoke that fire of urbanization, but do it in a way that creates on-ramps of opportunity and includes everyone. We have to build a city for all and urbanism for all, and we have to build a middle class. That's the challenge of, of our new generation of urbanites and city leaders. And that's what I want to talk, take a little time to talk to you all about today. 
What better place to do it than New York City in this phenomenal university where I hold a joint appointment between here and the University of Toronto. Uh, John Sexton brought me here. I get to work with a fabulous group of people like Dean Rosemary Scanlon, who, who I've known for the better part of a decade, who probably knows more about the inner workings of this city and its economic development machinery than anyone who heads our phenomenal Shack Institute. Our, our new dean, Dennis DiLorenzo, who, who couldn't be with us today. He's dealing with a, a family matter and his mom's sick and uh, who's taken over the School of Continuing and Professional Studies and, and done it with great aplomb. Um, he's allowed us to build a new program that this event is really the kick up for, which you can see there. It's the Initiative for Creativity and Innovation in Cities. We're not just teaching academic seminars. We're getting our hands dirty. Uh, under the leadership of my great friend, Stephen Pedigo, who I've worked with for more than a decade, Stephen's the director of that program He'll be running a city building course, the first of its kind, for high school kids, for high school kids, starting later this month. In the fall, we'll be kicking off a new certificate program, not for academics, but for people out there in the real world, real world city builders and economic developers in this city and other cities in the suburbs and around the world, to give them the tools at an economical tuition and a certificate in how to do creative and inclusive economic development. We call it our Certificate in Creative Cities and Economic Development. And we'll be undertaking real applied research on this city in the future. So that's what we're about. That's why all of us are here today and with these phenomenal panelists that you'll hear from a little later. Just an incredibly distinguished group of people who care so deeply about the future of this city, about its creativity, about making it more inclusive, about building these on-ramps, and ensuring its growth. Now, if you scroll back not too long ago to the economic crisis of 2008, you can remember, I can remember, because I, I wrote a cover story for The Atlantic about this. New York City was down. New York City was headed further down. The finance sector would collapse. And New York City would lose its global economic city status, whether it was Hong Kong or London, Shanghai, or the centers of the Sud Belt. New York was going to be eclipsed. And, and, and at that time, I said something that was seen to be a bit of an outlier, almost heretical. I said, going back and reading my own Jane Jacobs, that I thought the city had the seeds of its own reinvention and that we had miscast the city as simply a center for finance, insurance, and real estate when the city was so, so much more. I wrote a book about it. I called it a great reset. I argued that we were going through not just an economic crisis, but a transformation. And that transformation was from an older, bureaucratic, top-down industrial economy to a newer, knowledge-driven economy, which drew on the talents of its knowledge workers, its technology workers, and of all its workers. And I argued in that book that it wasn't enough simply to build that new economy. We had to build a new way of organizing our cities and urban areas. I called attention to suburbanization after the great crash, and how the rise of suburbanization and a new way of living, a new American dream of good, high-paying factory jobs combined with the ability to buy a home in the suburbs, created a middle class and extended the benefits of that industrial economy to many more people. And I argued that was our task today. That was the beginnings of our task today. That it was not only enough to build a knowledge economy and a technology economy, that we had to upgrade the millions upon millions of lower wage, lower skill service jobs. And we had to reinvest in our cities, build infrastructure, and build a new way of life and a new American dream around this urban revival. But I missed something. 
And I think all of us missed something. No one could have expected the speed of the revival, the speed of reurbanization, and the challenges this fundamental shift in our economy would cause. New York City has already gained the jobs it's lost back, more than four million private sector jobs. It's media, entertainment, digital media. Look at the boom in high technology in this city. I did the first studies of venture capital financed high technology in 1985 through 1988. New York City didn't get a dime in venture capital financing. The money that was collected here was sent to the San Francisco Bay Area and the suburbs of Boston. New York City, and particularly lower Manhattan, has now the second largest volume of venture capital investment in high technology aside from the Bay Area. It has eclipsed Boston, it has eclipsed Seattle, it has eclipsed Austin, and is becoming one of the world's great technology centers. But at the same time, this urban revival has caused deep and, and fundamental problems. You all know this. We had an election about it. I inequality has grown to heights not seen since the Gilded Age. Housing, as the Comptroller mentioned, has become unaffordable for many, if not for most, not just the working class, not just the middle class, but for the knowledge workers themselves. And our, 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 our city is sorting, is the word we use. It's separating, segregating. I'll have a major report on this coming out in the fall. Our cities are sorting and segregating in ways that are even worse than inequality itself. We are separating ourselves into more homogeneous communities by income, by class group, by level of education, and sometimes by race and ethnicity, but by all of these dimensions in ways that threaten to undermine the very diversity the density, the intermixing, the synergies and serendipities that make a city a center of innovation. As I said at the outset, we're dealing with something quite complicated. We're not going to solve it in an afternoon, but we're going to raise this conversation and we're going to raise it in this city. This isn't an either or, it's a both. The engine of our economy today isn't technology. It isn't automation. It isn't globalization. It isn't more powerful factories. It isn't simply technological innovation that occurs in a vacuum. It is the clustering of people in dense urban environments. That is the fundamental engine of human progress. And at the same time, that clustering of people, of skill, of investment and talent is dividing us. We have to square that circle if we want to be successful. We can't just bemoan it. We can't put the brakes on the engine. It would be the equivalent of going back to the industrial age and saying the solution is to burn down the factories and to go back to the farm. Now, what we did then is we built a middle class of factory workers and gave them the ability to participate in the dream. We have to stoke that engine of clustering, but create the on-ramps and make it work for all. My academic field has a real challenge. When I look at my field, I see it divided into two fundamentally imposed camps, and I think you'll all recognize this. On the one hand are the urban optimists. I put myself in that camp. I put people like Edward Glazer in that camp. My, my colleague Paul Romer, Rosemary Scanlon, Bruce Katz at the Brookings Institution, Ben Barber, who says that mayors can and should do more. People who believe that the urban future is optimistic, but I think we've overestimated it and looked at it in very rose-colored glasses. None of us anticipated, myself included, the deep and fundamental problems that would be generated by this urban revival and the unevenness with it, which it would spread. If, if New York and London and Hong Kong are succeeding, Cleveland and Detroit and many of the old Sunbelt cities are struggling, our winners and losers, the gaps become bigger, but not just between cities and metro areas, not just between New York and Detroit, between San Francisco and Cleveland, within our cities. The same factors that are creating winners and losers across the world are creating winners and losers side by side in our cities. 
We have a story where a third of us, not just the 1%, not just the 5%, a third of us who understand the knowledge economy, who understand the tools of digital media, who make technology work for us, are doing pretty well. But two-thirds of us are falling further and further behind. You all know the story. The old economy of manufacturing has fallen by the wayside. We lost nearly half of our manufacturing jobs and working class jobs, including blue collar construction jobs since 1970. We've lost hundreds of thousands of jobs and our blue collar working class manufacturing sector continues to decline, taking with them those good jobs. We've grown a new two-tiered economy. We've seen the rise in a fundamental way of this knowledge, technology, innovation, and creative-driven economy here in New York. And if people tell you this is a business and finance and management-driven economy, it is to an extent, but not exclusively. We've grown about 260,000 jobs in finance since the crisis, 6% growth rate. We've grown about 210,000 management jobs, a 6% growth rate. We've grown another 125,000 jobs in arts, design, media, and entertainment, a 12% growth rate, twice the level as business, finance, and management. And our most dominant clusters are in that area. When I look at the transformation of, an, of a segment I know, the media landscape, and look at the powerful pull this city has on new media and the creation of new media companies and the disruption that's going on in the traditional media, it's because we have linked journalism to technology. I have a friend who's a great music producer. He tells me that if you're a creative person, if you're a working person today, you're not just going to make it on your wits. You have to be in a media capital with great media channels and distribution systems, and you have to know how to work that media. This is an incredible pull. We're bolstering our technology. We're attracting some of the greatest technology talent and building some of the most powerful technology companies in the world and with this university in Columbia and the new Cornell campus and more. The future at the high end and the ability of this city to attract people and talent from the globe, not just from the burbs, but from the globe. But on the other side are the two-thirds that are falling behind. If we have 1.5 million people in the creative and knowledge and technology sector, we have nearly 2 million in the service sector. They prepare our foods, they make our beds, they clean our homes, they take care of our landscapes, they take care of us in restaurants, they give us manicures and haircuts. They're the lifeblood of this city. They are an infrastructure in which the knowledge economy rests, and while the knowledge economy moves forward, they move backward. And that's what we're talking about, building on-ramps of inclusion, extending the benefits of the engine of clustering to this tremendous group of people. On a whole, they average about 38,000 a year, which isn't bad, comparatively speaking, if you look at them in contrast to service workers in other parts of the country. But when you look at the main segments, <coughs> office administration, food service and preparation, personal services and healthcare support, many of those workers barely crack 25,000. Most of them need two and three and four. Family workers, to make a living wage. We have to upgrade those jobs, and we have to build a new middle class way of life. And that's what this project is about. We're going to be doing research on it, not just for the city as a whole. We're going to be releasing research briefs on each borough. And one of the things that strikes us is how part time and temporary and self employed this part of our economy is. You might think Manhattan is the center of freelance workers and the self-employed free agents. But in fact, the rates of self-employment and part-time work are two and three and four times higher in the outer boroughs for the low-paid, less skilled, marginalized service workers. So we have to work on two fronts. The first front is we've got to make these jobs better jobs. 
Comptroller has called for an emerging business council. A group of people who can work together in these emerging technologies, and he released that tremendous report about a year or so ago with his team about how do we make the technology economy work for more people? How do we include more people in its inner workings? We're going to have to upgrade those service jobs. We've got to increase the minimum wage. 50 to 60 percent of the local median wage is the figure the experts say will increase that wage and bolster our base, but not hurt our competitiveness. That's 15 plus dollars an hour, much higher than it needs to be in Buffalo or, or Syracuse or, or Phoenix. But we have to do more than that. Nearly 70 million Americans, 2 million New Yorkers toil in these low wage service jobs. We can't just elevate the minimum wage. We've got to turn them into good family supporting jobs. And I remember my father's words. My father was born in 1921 in Newark, New Jersey. Got a job in 1934 in the ironbound section of Newark at Victory Optical making eyeglasses. At the time he took that job, in the middle of the Great Depression, it took nine family members to make a living wage. Nine family members, his six siblings, himself and his mom and dad, my grandma and grandpa. My dad enlisted in World War II, stormed the beaches at Normandy and fought in all those great battles. When he came back from the war, he told me, Rich, as if by magic, as if by magic, my crappy job turned into a good job. The unions did it. FDR did it. Collective bargaining did it. The Wagner Act did it. Rich, I could get married. I could buy a house. And they moved to a New Jersey Italian-American suburb called North Arlington. Buy a house, put you two boys through Catholic school and through Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. My dad became part of an American dream. But it was not only by making manufacturing jobs good jobs, and we have to do the same thing, and we can do the same thing for service jobs. Look, as a country, we decided we'd pay more for our cars, more for our washing machines, more for our television sets. Henry Ford understood this as well as FDR. We needed a middle class of workers to buy the stuff we were producing. We can pay a little bit more for a cup of coffee. We can pay a little bit more for a stay in a hotel. We can pay a little bit more to have our home cleaned. And it's really pennies on the dollar. And, and you know, a little bit more for people to take care of our kids, our aging parents. What's more important to you? The food that you eat, how your parents are cared for, how your kids are cared for, than the car you drive. And that car isn't even made here anymore. It's made overseas. So we got, we got to bite the bullet, and we got to do that. And we're going to work on it. We're going to call together the comptrollers already working on it. We're going to call together the leaders of the service. And you know what? This is good for them. I met with the head of a major real estate fund the other day who told me of her biggest problem. It used to be she couldn't find tech workers to work in her startup hubs. She now can't find retail workers and food preparation workers to work in the urban downtown stores because they have to live so far away that their commute is intolerable. And in many cities where they don't have a transit system like this when they can't afford the commute. But it's not only that it's going to create a consuming base, it's not only that it's going to drive up demand. Our city service economy is the infrastructure, not only of tourism and travel and entertainment, it's the infrastructure which makes the knowledge economy thrive, making it more efficient, making it more skilled, making the people that work in it more engaged. And Zainet Tan, the great researcher at MIT Sloan School shows, the more you pay retail workers and service workers, the more you engage them in their work, they more than pay for that by returning that in better service delivery, better efficiency, and a higher stock price for the companies they work for. But then there's the other side of this. Just like in the New Deal, just like in the Great Depression, the last transformation, we not only have to build up a middle class by lifting up the wages, we've got to give people a new way of life. We've got to build an infrastructure, which is the comptroller's words, an infrastructure for an urban economy. Now think of it. For the past 50 years, since before I was born, since my dad was a kid, we've been building the infrastructure of a suburban American dream. We have been pouring tax dollars into building interstate highways, to subsidizing infrastructure, to incentivizing home mortgage loans, to creating secondary markets to flip mortgages around, which caused the crisis in the first place. 
a massive subsidy to a way of life that has outlived its shelf life and is actually counter to the clustering force that moves us forward. We have to make a shift that's bigger than that to both re-urbanize our cities to create affordable housing. Oh, I said today here on NYU's campus, I use this as an example. You're looking at one of the great success stories of affordable housing in the world. Many of us, if not most of us, who are tenure-track faculty live in subsidized, university-subsidized housing close to campus, enabling us to do our jobs and interact with students and building a great knowledge hub. If it works for us, it can work for more people. But we can't just do this alone. The mayor can't just do this alone. This is going to take a bigger effort than, than all of us. What causes gentrification and housing on affordability? It's not just an income and a skills gap. We are resting on the laurels of an infrastructure that's 100 plus years old. We haven't built any more of it. We haven't built much new transit. We haven't built much new rail. And so what happens? The people with means colonize those public goods. They colonize the transit stops. They colonize the places near the center because there's too little of it. And there's not enough density so that more people. We have to invest in an infrastructure of transit-oriented development, we have to massively rescale our, and it's not just the creating, the comptroller said this so well, it's not just building affordable housing, that's an important part of the picture. It's building an entire infrastructure for an urban way of life. And you know what, we have a lot of big edge on a lot of other places that don't have any transit or rail connective infrastructure. We have the bones to build upon. Well. You know, I'm passionate about this, and I, I could talk all day about it, but I just want to summarize some of the key things that, that we think we should do going forward. We've got to make a living wage a basic human right. We've got to peg that at 50 to 60 percent of the local median. We've got to upgrade those service sector jobs and call together the best and the brightest in industry that are, share that mission. We've got to get together the Henry Fords of our day and have them show us a path to making higher paying, more engaged service jobs, bringing the real skills and paying the service workers for those skills. As the comptroller has outlined, we have to take a much broader view of high tech. We need to understand that every job in our future is a technology job. If you're going to be an artist, if you're going to be a musician, if you're going to do indie music, if you're going to do hip hop, if you're going to do rap, if you're going to do R&B, whatever you're going to do, you've got a hundred. If you're going to be a journalist, at the time, the tragic time that my colleagues in journalism who do traditional print journalism are being laid off, there is a very high-paying market for data-driven journalists who know how to use computers and analyze and track big data. We've got to make sure that there are real on-ramps that connect everyone to the knowledge and technology economy. We got to set up real vocational training programs. We got to make sure that those kids who are interested in art, well, the comptroller mentioned how important art education, interested in music, have programs that they can link to. And if they're curious about that and curious about how to do digital technology and combine that, you know, and that's why in this new area of music, the Swedes and the Northern Europeans are eating our lunch. For the first time in modern history, they're eating our lunch. Because our kids may still have the musical talent and understand the rhythms and the beats, but they have had the access to the digital technology, and that's why they're becoming the greatest centers of production and producers in the world. We need not only high-tech incubators, we've done a great job on that, and accelerators. We need all tech, all creative, inclusive incubators. You know, part of this new dream is that you can do your own thing. Well, we have a great support structure for the professor with a new ID and PhD in software engineering or biotechnology. But for those young people who want to open everything from a manicure salon to a hair salon to a new printing business to whatever it is, we have to expand those supports. We have to build an infrastructure for a creative economy that includes everyone and it extends out to all the boroughs. And we need to make sure that infrastructure is broadband and high tech, but is a transit infrastructure, which is second to none. We have to make sure that we can really build, 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 and build more, not only in the city, but in the close areas where people want to live. Um, it's not just affordable housing. It is. It's not just 
developing middle class jobs. It is really about building an entire infrastructure of a new way of living and working. And that conversation has to start here because it clearly is not starting elsewhere. And it's not starting in Washington. Um, I've already said what we will do. At NYU and our new initiative in creativity and innovation in cities, uh, we'll be launching our research program. And our research program isn't going to be pie in the sky research. It's going to be digging into these problems for the city as a whole and for each of the boroughs. Looking in detail at Brooklyn and Staten Island and, and Queens in every nook and corner of this city as to what their economic clusters are, what their economic assets and weaknesses are, and how they can capitalize. We're going to launch that certificate program aimed at training and retraining the next generation of urbanists, city builders, and urban economic developers. And we're going to extend this effort down to the high schools. We're going to hopefully begin to reach, and you can see it. You can see the generational shift. You can see the way so many of our young people are passionate about cities. We're going to create a discipline around urbanism and city building. We're going to become a hub of this conversation, working with colleagues like Dean Scanlon, working in our school, working in this university, colleagues like Mitch Moss and Paul Romer and Steve Coonan. We're going we're to be a big hub of this conversation. And we're going to make an inclusive conversation that includes all of you that want to work with us. You see, where else can it be done? We live in the most powerful city in the world, a city that has increased its economic distance, even over London and Hong Kong and Shanghai. We live in a city that's more than it's millions upon millions of people, and a metro that's 20 or 25 million and continues to grow and attract the best of the brightest from around the world. And in the past, it's the place that has led these transformations. It's the place that the textile industry was born, not too far from here. The first technology-infused factories in and around Soho. The place that launched a garment workers' union and a garment workers' movement. The neighborhoods of the East Village and the Lower East Side. That's where workers organized to demand better rights. The place that launched Jane Jacobs and change the way we think of urbanism. You see, every time there's been a test and an economic transformation, New York City has been the place that's led the world. I know it seems tough, and that some of us are pessimistic, and that some of the best minds of my generation of urbanists think, oh my god, things couldn't be worse. Things could not be worse. Our neighborhoods are gentrifying. They're becoming homogeneous. The diversity from David Byrne to Moby, they're telling us we're no longer a center of creativity. Baloney. The city's best days are ahead of us. For sure, urbanism's best days are ahead of us. Because the motor force of economic development, which used to be movement to the suburbs, creating holes in the donuts, has been turned around. Because the motor force of economic development is exactly what Jane Jacobs told us it was. It was the clustering of a diverse groups of people in urban centers. Now, it may look like that's tough to achieve, but it's much tougher to refill that hole in the donut. The task before us right now is simple. We have to grab that clustering force, we have to grab that economic engine, and we have to make it work for more people. We have to build those very real on-ramps to a creative and inclusive economy, and we have to make sure that we build the broad infrastructure, urban infrastructure we need to make sure that we're not only competitive and economically successful, but the benefits of our economic success extend to all our people. That's a grand mission, but it's one that all of us are really very serious about. Thanks for your patience and listening, and look forward to working with you on this effort. Please join me in welcoming New York One's Errol Lewis and our first distinguished panel to the stage.
Am I on? Mic's on? Yes. Good afternoon. Very glad to see you. The other panelists are going to come up in a minute, and I'll, I'll introduce them briefly. Uh, one of the conditions on which I agreed to moderate this panel was they said I could also be a participant and share some <laughs> thoughts. So instead of just reading introductions and asking a couple of questions, I wanted to um, give my own reaction to, uh, to Richard Florida's uh, comments, and, um, and then we'll start our conversation. Um, some, some of the challenges that I see in um, moving forward with this vision of a more inclusive and creative city um, really sort of, I think, are obvious to people who follow politics, at least, in the city, which is that it's easier said than done. You know, we talk about um, something even as basic as the transportation infrastructure, which presumably we all agree is key to the, the, the economic development of the city, and folks were only a couple of days away from a possible railroad strike. And if you listen to the conversation about how that has gone, I mean, some of the conversation I find really striking. They say that the conductors are the highest paid in the, in the nation, and why should they get a penny more? But if you look at the, uh, the, the documents, the actual findings about where they are in this contract negotiation, um, it turns out that they haven't, if you account for inflation, haven't had a raise since 1991. Um, this is, this is, these are the kind of questions that are going to come up constantly as, as we sort of pursue this line of inquiry about can we be more creative and more inclusive at the same time. Um, in many of these fights, there will be winners and there will be losers. That's not always a, a, a pretty thing. And I think Scott Stringer knows as well as any and better than most that a, a tough political battle can get quite nasty. If you saw how he got to become controller. Um, there were a lot of words said, and not all of them were accurate, and not all of them were kind. So we shouldn't have any illusions about what it will take to sort of uh, get a lot of this conversation past the talking phase and into the implementation phase. Um, when it comes to the uh, growing the service sector, um, a, a very big part of uh, what Professor Florida was talking about, I mean, you know, there, there have been a lot of hearings and a lot of discussion about what that will take. Um, it includes phrases like wage theft. It includes things like unregulated industries, the car wash industry, heavily immigrant service sector, somebody's got to wash the cars of the people who do drive cars, and um, no regulation whatsoever. No agency um, looking at whether or not they're doing anything that they're supposed to be doing um, as far as worker health and safety. So there's a lot of that that we're going to also have to face. And I guess finally before I uh, introduce the panel, I mean, there, there are some interesting issues around transit. I mean, I mentioned the LIRR, but also recently in the news we learned that uh, the Far Rockaway ferry service is going to be discontinued. Didn't make it into the budget. Um, the, the folks in that part of Queens, the folks in Southeast Queens, uh, have the longest and most agonizing commute in the whole United States. You try to get from Cambria Heights to Midtown, and you'll know exactly what I mean. Um, this, this is you know, considered sort of a, a local issue. Well, that's their problem. Well. If you want to talk about the, the kind of vision that's been laid out today, it's going to have to become everybody's problem. And it won't be seen necessarily. It won't be framed as. My, my colleagues in the media won't frame it as you know, a tech issue. But if you want to know how to grow the economy, all of those kind of issues are going to have to um, maybe be interpreted a lot differently. And I guess finally, one thing that um, is worth keeping in mind, and um, Richard Florida knows this better than most because of his connection to Toronto, when you make some of these changes, when you make a city more inclusive, when you make it more attractive to the creative class, it can trigger a backlash. Um, Rob Ford, you may think of as a, a buffoon, um, but he wrote into office on a backlash against a lot of the bike lanes and the creative arts uh, festivals and a lot of the development in downtown Toronto. There were people who felt that that wasn't the lifestyle they wanted, that wasn't their vision of the, of the city. And there were enough of them who voted for him, and you know the, the results, I guess, we're, we're still seeing. Um, if you think that can't happen in New York, I would suggest that you know um, Rudy Giuliani wasn't an accident. You know there was a sense. I mean, when I talk about backlash politics, I mean, you know, when people feel aggrieved, when they feel that they've been ignored, when they feel that the city is going in a direction that they don't like, they can and will make their voices heard. And um, it's, uh, we want it to be an inclusive city. We want it to be a creative city. Uh, it's also inescapably, in my humble opinion, a contested city. 
And so um, it's one of the things that I'll be looking for as we go forward. So thank you for letting me get that off my chest. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, Uh, the, the panelists here in some ways need no introduction, um, and their biographies are in your, uh, your, your booklet, so we won't uh, go too deeply into it, but I want to thank um, Anna Holmes for, for uh, joining us. I want to thank um, Mazdak Rossi, um, the, the uh, co-founder of Milk, and Carmen Wong Ulrich, of course, from uh, Malacom Productions, who's known to you from lots of different places, um, for, all, for all being here. And let me start with you, Anna. Um, what's the, as, as somebody who is considered a, uh, a model of how you get a new creative enterprise off the ground, what are some of the challenges that you foresee? What is it that uh, a city government that has not necessarily been in the habit of listening, what do they need to hear? What do they need to do? Where do you see things heading? For, for is, the, is your question about young creatives who want to who wanna start their own things? like like. like Entrepreneurs, or well, both the startups and the yeah. the maturing ones, like yours. Yeah. Um, well, I I started a, a website, but I didn't own it, which is to say that all of the kind of um, requirements behind the flashy front page, you know, Jezebel. The, yeah, the payroll, the, the 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 tech support, et cetera, were not mine to deal with, which was uh, great because it freed me to deal with editorial. But you know, when I thought about um, my future and whether I would start something else on my own um, and have to take on those other those other responsibilities like raising money <laughs> or having money it's you know it's it's still at this point in my career a very frightening proposition and I'm not sure that I have an answer as to like how could the city help help me other than like give me money <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm not gonna ask them for that um, uh, so it's you know I, I feel that New York feels very thriving in you know in terms of a number of industries especially tech um, but I'm not sure that the people who even work in those industries, m many of which are, are, are fairly well paid, feel that um, secure in themselves or secure enough to kind of strike out on their own. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the, the cost of housing in the city. And you know, uh, I didn't hear all of uh, Mr. Florida's speech. I came in about um, halfway through, and I know he, I heard, did hear him talk a bit about affordable housing. But I just, I, I guess, I can't stress that enough, even for someone like me who is not living paycheck to paycheck anymore, um, but whose every decision is, 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 is influenced by the fact that I have to pay rent, and I have to pay very high rent. Um, and I've always had to pay high rent since I moved here in 1991, but it's gotten exponentially more absurd and ridiculous. And um, you know, I, don't, I guess I don't see the issue of affordable housing being pushed as much as, it, as I think it should be. There was a, a piece I don't, in, in one of the local papers, about the Domino Sugar Factory and, and how it's going to be converted into uh, condos. And I think it was in the context of Kara Walker's uh, show there and what would happen after the show ended. And I believe that the, I don't remember the exact percentage of apartments that were going to be um, kind of under the affordable housing umbrella, but there was some tiny percentage considering how much the developers were going to be making um, and redoing that complex. And it was just kind of horrifying that there wasn't more of an, of an outcry about that. Uh, so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I do. I really do feel that the cost of housing in the city has, has gotten uh, bananas. I don't. Um, I don't. Uh, you know, fault any of my my peers, people who are my age. I'm 41, or any younger people who either decide not to come to the city or who leave the city. And, and in fact, I've considered doing it myself because of, uh, of the fact that it's just you know, as mm. as as the uh, the the booklet that we all got. Uh, in the beginning said, you know, New York seems like it's becoming a, a shopping mall for the 1%. Mm. Well, can, is, is there a way to um, pu push that issue through transportation? I mean, I was interested to see that there's talk about building a Metro North link up to, say, Co-op City, mm -hmm. which, if it can get you to Midtown in 20 minutes, well, all of a sudden, that's, you know, that's that closer than parts things. of Queens. Sure, sure, sure. And, and, and parts of Queens, um, like you mentioned, the far, like the Rockaways, which, which are, you know, I love visiting, but I can't imagine living there because they're so far away. Uh, my sister, for a time, who was a social worker, lived in Hollis, Queens, and had to work um, down by Brighton Beach. And to get there was just, I think it took her about two hours. I mean, she had to go into Manhattan and then back, and then back out into Brooklyn. Um, and, that, and, that was, and that was not tenable. So sure, yeah, absolutely transportation. Um, but you know, also housing and not pushing um, 
uh, lower middle class and and uh, and lower class people out to the edges of of, of the city, but you know, uh, inviting them into the center of the city, which has gotten bigger in a way. I mean, you know, Manhattan used to used to feel like Manhattan was the center of New York, and now actually I wouldn't say that anymore. Mm. Um, I would say that a lot of a lot of exciting things are happening in the other boroughs. Maybe not Staten Island, but, <laughs> um, but uh, a lot of the yeah. other boroughs. You're get I some mean, <laughs> I mean creative <laughs> stuff. <laughs> um, but uh, my dad lives there, so he's. So don't worry, he'll yell at me too. But um, <laughs> in Queens and Brooklyn, um, which have become, um, which are kind of, I guess, trendy right now. I mean, mm -hmm. which has its own issues. Um, but I think that's an exciting thing. I think it's exciting that, that at least my idea of New York has spread beyond Manhattan, and the idea of a lot of other people's New York has spread beyond Manhattan. You have TV shows set in Brooklyn, uh, but I'm, I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that 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 it's it's good for the for the longtime residents, especially those who are. Uh, can I can I add yeah. Anna to your emphasis about about transportation, Errol? I feel like um, that makes me sad that we have to focus a lot or feel like we need to move our focus to just transportation because these huge commutes are huge and they take up a lot of time that could be spent working or with family. So it's its own burden, it's its own cost. It has its own cost, even though it's not fi necessarily financial or just financial. Um, and I, it makes me sad that Manhattan can't be a place for everybody. And I'm speaking as a third generation Dominican Manhattan born person. <laughs> My grandfather came here in the big you know, flood of Dominicans in the late 50s and had opened um, his dry cleaners on the corner of Broadway and Tiananmen, 124th Street. Had that for 30 years. My mother went to work, and her mother, my grandmother, went to work in the garment district in Oscar de la Renta's factories down there. And you know, for, for me, I, I went to Brooklyn for 10 years because of the need for space because I had a child and it was married and I needed space and I came back, now I'm a single mom living downtown, but, and of course my financial experience has changed a lot and I've lived in every neighborhood in Manhattan pretty much, but it makes me sad that now I'm looking to move back uptown and when I see where I used to live, I was on Claremont and TM in there on 125th and I see the change, I went back, my mother sold our apartment that she had from 1960 which she got from her parents, sold it in 91. And I went back and she made nothing. They bought it for 40, they sold it for 90. I went back after I graduated college, I wanted to buy back in, I missed my neighborhood. It was up to about 450. It's pretty much, it was a four bedroom. One bath though, um, and it was a railroad. You know, it was nothing special, lots of cucarachas, you know, that's just the way it was. And I just, uh, but, but I, missed, I missed it so much. I've gone back three times because I want to live on the same street. Mm. And I'm, I'm nostalgic, yes. But I think that, that I, though I'm doing a lot better than maybe you know, my cousins or such, but why can't we have that here? And why can't we have affordable housing here? Transportation definitely needs to be developed. But I miss the ability to live here with your family. And I don't think that's necessarily just nostalgia. I think that it's a reality of having wages for service class, having op options and opportunities or, that are beyond needing a graduate degree or getting backed by a VC. Like there needs to be more options in terms of pay and income so that people can stay here and not have two hour commutes. And um, as, a, as a new father, Mazdak, uh, yes. uh, this, this is an issue I, I think um, not only for someone like you who's a CEO, but also yeah. for your employees, right? Yeah, it's funny because I knew I was coming on this panel and um, a few days ago I decided to, we have about 170 employees all in, we, we have a creative media company, works a lot in new, new digital stuff and uh, it was something like 84% of our employees were in the meatpacking in Manhattan, live in Brooklyn and they commute in. So in one way we know they can't afford to be in the city but at the same time that means that if I am going to open milk in the future, I would probably be in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So five years ago, our clients like Vogue and Prada and Gucci and all these guys we work with, Victoria's Secret, they wouldn't go to Brooklyn to shoot. They wouldn't go there for us to create their productions, their, even in their events. Today they will. Mm -hmm. And um, so at the same time as Manhattan is getting more expensive, 
It's doing wonderful things to the boroughs. I mean, the center of creativity today in New York, to me, is Brooklyn. It is one of the best branded cities in the United States. Look at the Nets. Look at everything you can think of. It's a badge of honor to live there and be there and work there. All the creative companies, one of the biggest media companies today that's really, really taking off, like Vice Media, is Brooklyn born. They're staying there. They're never coming to Manhattan. So that's OK. Um, this week, I'm going up to the Bronx to look at a building that we may build production facilities, because there's young guys opening restaurants there. There's great little hotels popping up. So I, I don't view it as, as I, I, I've always thought, the, the, unfortunately, the, the tale of two cities. That didn't bother me, because when I came here in 92, I was 24. I was a college dropout. I borrowed five, $700 from my mom. And I came here because this was the center of creativity. And I worked really hard. I lived in a small little room with three friends. And we worked our way up. And it's still happening. It's just we, we had to go to the Lower East Side to live. And now people are going to Brooklyn. Brooklyn's so expensive, they're moving into yeah. Bushwick. Mm. Um, <laughs> but I think that because it's growing outwards, uh, obviously, infrastructure is very important. The other day, everyone was saying, let's go to Red Hook. And we said, oh, there's no subways there. How are employees going to get there? Mm -hmm. Look at Bushwick. Bushwick is incredible because everywhere there's a train, there's a subway station, it's like a, it's like a well of opportunity. And if you take, you literally are sitting there and you look at a subway stop, you could draw a circle about four blocks around that subway stop, and all the creatives are moving in. So they're like a fountain of youths that are popping up, and it's all based on transportation and infrastructure. So if we build that right, it's OK that it moves out. And other neighborhoods benefit from the fact that we have to go there because of cost. And I guess, I guess my question is what happens to the residents in those neighborhoods when the creatives come in and mm -hmm. like kind of push them, push them out because the rents start rising. Like that's, I experienced that. Um, I moved from the East Village in 1995 because it was too expensive to Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which at the time was not the Williamsburg that it is now. And I was there for about five years, and it started becoming the Williamsburg that it is now. And I got kind of grumpy about it. Um, <laughs> I, I complained vociferously about the scene on the L train platform and the rents going up. And I also lived in a building that should have been condemned. And then I moved to Queens. Um, because Williamsburg was getting built up. And then Queens, my neighborhood of Long Island City, started getting built up, and then I got grumpy and left there. But, and I wasn't a pioneer. There were people who were you know, moving into these places long before me, but I was part of the problem. You know, when I was moving into these neighborhoods because they were affordable, it was making it less affordable for the longtime residents. Mm. Maybe Williamsburg is not the greatest example mm. because it was very industrial, um, yeah. as was Long Island City. So if people were you know, inhabiting spaces that, that had been previously used for commercial use or had been abandoned in, in many cases. Right. But I don't think that's the case with a lot of other neighborhoods where um, the young creatives are moving well, in. Well, that's, that's like me. Washington Heights. I mean, this is the, the whole reason that I was able to afford to have a fully renovated one bedroom in graduate school when I was pulling 20 grand a year and getting you know 50 plus in debt <laughs> was because another Dominican family had been pushed out. Mm. So I was very torn going up there and being in that neighborhood and being of these two cultures. And Richard mentioned that it's not necessarily a cultural schism so much as it's a class issue. And I really struggled with, wow, I'm here because my landlord has decided that he wants to get all the students now that it's safer, you know, get more people. In. So I get the point and I love all the opportunity and I love that Brooklyn and, and, and Queens, and especially the Bronx now, everybody go to the Bronx. I want more development in the Bronx. but. I feel that there is still, there's a lot of people that are being left behind and pushed out. Mm, sure. So having access to housing. Especially, there's two, two effects, right? So if we go into, or let's say if industry or creatives go into an industrial area, like we did in 96 in the meatpacking, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, or, or hopefully we'll do in Bushwick, or maybe in the, it's, it's, there's, another, there's an effect that happens. And then there's an effect when you go into a residential area and those people move in there and the rents go up. And I remember in the East Village, that's where we all used to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, today it's like very expensive. But the meatpacking in 96, we bought this building that was sitting there for four years that nobody wanted for $6 million. And it was a big deal for us. Um, 
five, six years later, we sold it for like, it was around 50 some million. We were celebrating. Two years later, they flipped it for 181 million. <laughs> Last year, it sold for $300 million. Oh my the God. The same building. Now, if that's not a writing <laughs> on the wall that our lease, I mean, we have a long-term lease, so we're very lucky, but we know we're gonna be pushed out when that mm. lease is, there's no way we can stay there. Yeah. And that's what the meatpacking is, is. We watch this neighborhood change. I sit on the bid committee, which we're trying to do right now with the city, and it's, but it's not my neighborhood anymore. And, and now we know where we probably will end up, which will probably be somewhere in Bushwick or Brooklyn, somewhere out there. So these things happen. I don't know how you stop them, um, but I think that there, there's the two effects, residential and commercial, that happen. Well, let me ask you about, uh, as you get to be uh, a more mature business, um, the city put out a report, and, they, and there were a lot of people um, from the tech sector in particular who said that many of New York's landlords don't understand what your needs are, that the buildings are not properly wired, that they, they can't retrofit them or they haven't retrofitted them for broadband. Um, that it ends up being a real serious problem, that, that it makes the space that much harder to locate or to rework. Is that been the case for you? Is really, we, we expanded to Los Angeles. We bought, and when we went there, we, it was literally like the mayor came, grabbed us to LAEDC, which was so proactive. They sat us down. We knew we needed clean power, and we needed a lot of data. And, in, and so they really put us, we went into an enterprise zone in Hollywood. We revitalized a, an old, that, that, you know, I hope happens more in New York. As, hopefully when we want to move, we're expanding to London. The same thing's happening, the, the, the UK Trade Commission. Everyone's very aggressive. So in New York, for us to continue this edge, we have to be very aggressive. I see it happening in other cities where where they're, they're really being proactive. It must be every, once every two weeks, I get a call from the London Partners, which is the mayor's office, and then you get it from the UK. They were so aggressive about tech and media moving into London that the Prime Minister Cameron came to Milk for a brunch. Wow. And brought Prince Harry with them. <laughs> now, if that's not aggressive to get American companies to go there, I don't know what is. We shut the neighborhood down. It was like, and I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if, if my own city hold, held my hand that way and really helped us, not just with um, finding a building, but also with infrastructure, which is really important. Mm -hmm. I mean, my exposure too, I'm on the board of the New York Urban League, um, and we have a program for STEM with young girls and bringing urban use, because you mentioned broadband. I mean, access to broadband and access to computers and laptops is a really big issue. And of course, we had to get private sponsorship to open our computer lab. Um, and I think it's just so vital to not leave behind the urban youth in all of the development that we do. And if we can't get it on a education level or a federal level, I mean, we, we really have to get the private sector much more involved in mentoring and bringing in and just going into the community or accessing from the community. You know, a lot of the folks that we have on board are really big corporations, you know, like UPS and Geico and such, but to have more companies like yours who are really at the forefront of building these jobs and having these kids come to you or having programs where you can join up with these kids so that you give the folks that are here an opportunity. We have to fix our um, internship programs in New York. Everyone's getting in trouble in media because we, we, we have a great program with Parsons, all the young kids, so the photography students come into the photography division. The film kids come into our film division. The fashion kids come into our fashion division. We, we, you know, we are trying to work credit hours for them. There, there was a girl yesterday I met in our elevator who came all the way from Delaware. She's getting credit hours with her school to be with us for three months. We love that, and that's how we got started. I started as an intern. I worked for free. I worked very hard. So it's part of what New York creative culture has always been. But there, we need to fix all the rules and businesses. Pay for help. the internships. And we need we would need, be one. <laughs> we need to figure out we, paid we internship. I, I this is one of my biggest. It dry, my one of my first my first book. I mentioned this because it was my own experience. I didn't have the opportunity to be to have family to help. So if you don't have a safety net, you can't 
work for free. So you end up working two jobs to get the internship or you end up finding just a way to get a paid job and working in a job that you don't want because you just have to find a way to get in. But I like that a lot of media now has realized that you need to pay your interns or else the pool of interns that you get are simply the ones who have somebody to subsidize their living. Sure. And you need or, to, you yeah. don't have the talent, the same talent pool. So when I was pitted against a bunch of other kids that I was an undergrad with and they had family to pay for them, I couldn't get that very valuable sure. internship and maybe I was the best darn person for that job. You know, so I don't want the pay versus not pay to, to mean that you don't get the best people for I think job. I think, I think a lot of it is about paying interns, but I think that even when you pay interns, there's still a kind of closing of ranks that I've seen where kids get picked, kids from certain schools or who know somebody. I mean, a mm -hmm. lot of it is just like connections and nepotism. Yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to live in New York City uh, if it hadn't been for paid internships, uh, in addition to having a work-study job at NYU, because uh, I had both. Um, and that's what allowed me to live here. And, but I, I was telling um, uh, someone the other day that I'm not sure that if I were to move here now at the age of 18 and that I went to NYU and took out student loans and had a work study job and had a paid internship, if I could still live in New York. I think mm -hmm. the, the cost of living has gotten so expensive that I don't think I, even with those things I'd be able to do that now. But um, that was very important, uh, get, getting paid internships. But what you saw even in the paid internships that I had, and they were at, like, Good magazines, Entertainment Weekly, The New Yorker. Um, that the other interns, uh, I was the aberration. Like the NYU student was the aberration. The other ones were from Ivy Leagues and had very, you know, well-off or wealthy parents who could subsidize them living in New York. So even so, even then, it, you know, I was a very privileged person, but I was the least privileged of that group. And I think um, I, I think that people, the people who make the hiring decisions uh, about about internships, not only need to pay the interns, but need to be forced to look beyond the normal pool of applicants that they come across. Well, well, I mean, let, let's bridge that from interns into sort of entry level mm -hmm. or, right. or lower level. I mean, make a business case if there is one. What's the business proposition for uh, sort of growing our own employees here in New York, making them, you know, giving them on ramps into the creative economy? as opposed to the much, in some ways, simpler and perhaps easier and probably cheaper method of just going out and, and uh, recruiting uh, graduate students from all over the world? Hmm. I think the, the business question with bringing them on is, is a couple of things. One is we've seen the deterioration of benefits and full-time employment. Um, and Richard mentioned that. I think that that's a really big issue, I think specifically in media uh, and tech, and I don't think, it, it's a double-edged sword. Um, I'm a big fan of being an individual contractor. I think it's having control over what you create is very important and, and over your schedule. But I think, too, is that even though we have, you know, healthcare, it, it's still a tenuous position. I think there's more security, and I know that there's a lot of tension. I hear when I do talks around a lot of tension between um, employers of kind of the Gen X and older and millennials in terms, you won't stay, why should I invest in you? You're not gonna stay, you're just gonna hop and move someplace else and such. So I think there has to be a culture of mm -hmm. nurturing and also we know that there has to be, if not a clear, but let's carve out what the road looks like together, that sort of situation. But there has to be the understanding mm -hmm. that you may lose if you put a lot into somebody who's ready to just jump on the next hot thing, but at the same time, there has to be some understanding and trust that you can do it together and have a long career. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we, we always say that we grow our own. It's really hard to find people. So we, our interns become our employees and we move them up. Um, the person who runs our facilities and our studios, which is a big business, was our receptionist. So we, we are very proud of that. Um, but at the same time, there are these incredible programs. We have to, today with technology, things are moving really fast. And um, we have to support programs and ecosystems that are already happening with a lot of like tech stars, a lot of these um, companies, uh, these groups that are putting things after school as well for high school students to be able to sort of like bring young creative with creatives that are already in, in good positions and connect them so that there's a lot of mentorship going on. Um, all industries are being affected by sort of tech and media. So to be a successful company today, you have to be a media company. 
You have to think like a media, you have to think like a tech company. It's affecting everything. And just yesterday we had uh, 10 kids come from Brooklyn. They were all in high school. They're part of a mentorship program called Stoke. And we walked them through the studios and their eyes lit up and they're all from very sort of tough backgrounds. And we, we support a lot of these wonderful after school programs. They're in the after school programs in Brooklyn. So we need to connect, we have to build platforms to connect. I think Cornell, what's gonna happen at, at that campus is gonna be really great. Lots of the young kids need to go into those programs. Um, it's, it's all about connection and it's all about mentorship because it's all here, all the great, even the young kids that are New York kids, they see things that other kids don't see. They, they have museums that are at the top of the world. They, they get to experience things. They grow up very quickly. They're creative to start with. So we need to really give them tools. It's all right here. It's like we grow our own. And, um, and when someone does come to New York, like I did in my early 20s, I instantly became a New Yorker overnight. And um, so we, we have to really do, and with technology and sort of like all of this sort of programs that are happening that are community-based, I think that we have to, the city really, and policy really needs to support it. It has to be sort of like progressive education. Why, why are we not teaching code in, in junior high? And in England, it's mandatory, they're, they're starting next year. Mm. That was one of the biggest things David Cameron said, he said, all eighth graders are gonna learn code like they would French or Spanish. Mm -hmm. We need to have that, and uh, if they're going to be competitive. You bring up a point, children, childcare. Yes. Um, and this, this may be, seem niche to some of you, but this is a really big issue. Um, another group I work with is Dress for Success and building their financial literacy program, building other programs beyond just the suit, of course. But one of the biggest things that we come up against is that once these women get a job and make money and they actually have to save money and they do, and it's amazing transformation, if their child gets sick, and they don't have anybody to take care of that child, they lose their job. So I don't know what the answer is. I just know that it's an incredibly difficult situation to be in, to be a mother either. Maybe you have two parents at home and maybe you know, your, your spouse or partner is working like crazy as well. Maybe you're a single parent and you don't have family around. Not being able to, I mean the reason why I work for myself and I own my own companies is because I'm a single parent because I need the flexibility. And I've turned down a bunch of stuff because I need to be able to be available to my child if she needs me, if she's sick, if something goes wrong. And, and it's so important to understand that the, the service sector, the, the structure of the folks who aren't just in creative, but the ones who, you know, like, like Richard mentioned, clean your car or, to, or give you your lunch or your salad, those folks need some support beyond the wage at home, and I don't know what it looks like, I don't know how it's gonna get paid for, but I know that that is a huge issue that we run up against, and we have these great little think tanks where we, salons, where we try to get powerful women together and say, okay, what can we do mm. um, to build something, because that has become our last wall that we just can't break. Well, well let me ask you this, I mean, it's not like you all have a lot of extra time, I know, but, um, to what, what's the appetite when you think about yourself and your peers for jumping into some of these fights? Because something like what you just described, I mean, there are battles that go on in distant places like Albany, you know, and they're, and they're, <laughs> ugly, they're ugly fights and they're, and they're long and they're sustained and when you think you've won one, like they just had a big fight over the minimum wage and now here we are back to trying to get it closer to what Richard said is actually a, a sort of a meaningful living wage. Um, is, did, you, did you ever see that or do you see that as part of your obligations or, or as an opportunity, maybe even a necessity as a, as a business leader? You mean are we involved? I mean, I spent tw literally 20 to 25% of my time hmm. on nonprofit, um, mm -hmm. on two boards. Um, so the New York Urban League um, and CUP, which is the Council of Urban Professionals, the largest executive organization for professionals of color. Um, and Dress for Success, as well as Viva Broadway, which is the Broadway League's initiative to bring more Latinos to Broadway. I do this simply because I, for the luck of my birth, I wasn't born my mother or I wasn't born my grandmother, that they came here, that I have all these opportunities in this incredibly vibrant city, that my mother was a tiger mother who made sure that education was it. You know, it's, 
I cannot be who I am without doing that. And frankly, a lot of us who came up together, when I say us, I mean black and Latino women, when we came up through media together, and no one would see us beyond an assistant level. And I will tell you that I got my graduate degree because I couldn't break out of it. Mm. And we all helped each other. One got a book deal. She got the rest of us book deals, meaning she introduced us. Mm -hmm. One got on TV. Next thing you know, I'm on TV. Next thing you know, I have a show. But it was, if we, and we consistently do this. We mentor youth. We mentor new black and Latino women who are coming up, whether it's through STEM or through, through media. None of us can exist without doing that. It's very, very, very natural. Um, and I'm feeling very humble brag at the moment, but, yeah. uh, but I, I just, I would love to infect some passion about doing well, you know, that. I mean, I, I'm even talking about something even a little, a little more direct. When the conversation goes on about should there be regulation of the car washes, should there be an increase in the minimum wage, uh, and you hear people just sort of, you know, bashing yeah. the very notion, you know, those people don't deserve uh, a penny more, leave it to the private sector, the politicians have got this all wrong. You know, you ever maybe pick up the phone and call the editorial board uh, or call a columnist and say, look, I employ 170 people. You're out of your mind. The future of New York <laughs> is, a different, is a different kind of a conversation, and we need to change the, the, the way it all gets talked about. Any information about this? No, and I don't employ anybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 yeah. Where do yeah, they I, come solopreneurs? I, I, I feel yeah. like you guys are in a very unique position because they actually you know, are, are responsible for the... I, I mean, I, I, I wake up every morning and I'm like, all these people are putting their kids through school, they're, they're working hard, I gotta keep this business going, and I gotta make it successful. But at the same time, we, we've always been a place to support the next generation coming up. That's been really beneficial to our business because we're constantly getting great people coming up, and I don't have to go and try to steal people from other companies. It's like, we are our own competition, and we concentrate on ourselves. But you know, there's a. I love talking about policy. I I can't stand talking about politics, so that part is a little bit scary to business people, like especially new young ones like me. We know what policy would do good for our community and our business and our, you know. But at the same time, every time you go talk about it, you get you get washed up in politics, and and that we we back away from, especially people in the creative industries. Mm. Um, so, you know, that's something that, and, and we all know that the answer, the key is education. As a dropout, I say that, but it is true, you know, and, and it is because, um, you know, and I come from academic, both of my parents are PhDs, and I dropped out, it was a problem, but, um, but you know, I, I feel like that is really important because uh, I, I work a lot on non for profits especially mentorship programs, I think it's key, especially in the creative fields. Um, I couldn't come up where I was unless someone reached a hand down and pulled me up. So I feel like uh, everyone should have a hand to grab. And I also feel that when it comes to mentorship, all these young kids need to shoot for the stars. They need to look up this, a, a business leader and email them every day till that person goes, okay, I'll no. meet with you. <laughs> and and that, that's, that's what I did. I, I, there's a company that now we compete with, but he was my mentor that I emailed them every day. <laughs> and he finally gave me time to, to come and have coffee with him. I was 24 years old, and I'm very grateful to him. And, um, you know. I think there's something to be said for, for, for persistence. But, <laughs> and, like, and I was persistent, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was in my 20s. But, you know, I, I was able to be persistent because I could still afford to live here. I mean, the, the, those things, I couldn't have continued being persistent if I had had to move out. The one thing I was going to say that I've, I've noticed recently, at least in media and online media, is that there are a number, there are a number of people who are moving to the city um, to work in media who are further along age-wise than they used to be. So, for example, most, the, most people that I know in media have been here like me since they were teenagers, you know, 18, they came here to go to college, or they moved here after college when they were 21. I have, I, I, there's, it seems to be an influx of, of, of young adults, which is to say a little bit older young adults, in their late 20s, maybe even 30s, who are moving here um, for media jobs because they were, uh, they were discovered, and that sounds kind of patronizing, but they were discovered by um, media owners and editors who looked beyond New York City 
because of the internet, because you, you, can, you can find people's you know, amazing blogs and writing um, who live in different parts of the country, and they you know, saw talent and offered them a job with a living wage and then moved them to New York. So I, I, do, I see older adults moving to New York then I, I, in a way that feels very exciting. I feel excited by the idea that we can find creatives in other parts of the country and convince them to move here. Um, I'm just not sure what, what we can do about um, the New Yorkers who are already here who, who might have to leave because they can't afford to stay. So technology has kind of enabled um, you know, young creatives who want to move to New York but maybe couldn't do it without without the promise of, of, of a steady paycheck to do just that because they are visible. They're more visible than they used to be. Um, and a lot of that for everything, you know, has to do with the internet. I think to add to that, that you're seeing this sort of decentralization of creativity, which is really vibrant, wonderful. Like, you know, you used to go to these buildings that were ad agencies and creative houses. It would be one huge building filled with different divisions. And that's kind of falling apart. Brands are going directly to creatives. Agencies have to rethink who they are today. That really opens up an incredible opportunity for, for people that are what we call solopreneurs um, to set up shop. There are all these wonderful sort of new places opening up like Neuhaus, where you can go rent a chair and be in a creative community mm. and bump into other creatives. And brands can find you now. So. There is this decentralization that's going on, and I think it's really healthy. Well, and I guess my, this will be my, my final question is, do, do, when, when Richard Florida talks about density, I mean, that's kind of the whole premise of the, the, the whole notion of, of uh, the city as a place for all of this to happen. To what extent do you need to be here to be able to succeed? Um, is, uh, are, are we starting to see the kind of decentralization where you could disperse very broadly? Or does, do you get a, a tangible, measurable financial advantage from being here? Wow. That's um, a really good question. It's interesting. So my business attorney's in Boston. My <laughs> web designer is in Maryland. Uh, one of my agents is in LA. It, I mean, I, my life is kind of dispersed. I think with, of course, the web, that that's a very tangible thing to do. So to your point, it's kind of a matter of, do you need to live here? That decentralization, especially in media, it's amazing that you can get writers from everywhere. I mean, you remember, I mean, from back when I started in print, in the old print yeah. days, like everybody was in house. They had to live here. I mean, they lived here. The masthead of the magazine I was at for editorial was like 60 names long. Okay, now it's 10 or 12. It's really, it's sad, but at the same time, then it means that maybe writers who never had a chance can do, yeah. can do something, sure. and that's a really big deal. So, I, you know, what does it mean? I think you get more voices. I think that's really good. But again, if we are focusing again on New York City, um, is it at the expense of looking here or not? And what suffers? I don't know the demographics of it completely, but I do have to say that you know, working with urban kids, um, I feel that there is a lot of looking out. So maybe we need to look a little bit more here for that. Um. Yeah, I, I, it was funny because when we were looking at spaces in London, they kept saying tech city, tech city. And I looked over, I said, I don't want to be in tech city. I want to be around galleries. I want to be around creativity. I and they quickly were like, looked at each other and go, okay, we're never going to call it tech city again. <laughs> so it, it was like, uh, you know, we, we, we're here because of this energy and this battery that New York is. It's the greatest thing you look to, and, and, but there is, there's no doubt that there's times where I can't remember, I'm on the phone with one of our colleagues, and he may be in our LA office, or he may be somewhere. So it, there's no doubt that the, the walls are coming down, and, um, and you know, you, you could be virtual today, obviously, and, um, but there's also a lot more opportunity that way. With, with regards to like living in New York, you know, um, the older I get, the more I'm like, well, I could, I could, I could try living somewhere else. I've been here a long time. Uh, I just took a job, and the company is based in Miami, and I had to decide what I want to move to Miami, and, and they didn't pressure me. I mean, they, they, <laughs> <she's> <laughs> saying, good. good. <laughs> so I decided I wanted to stay in New York. I think for all of its, all of the issues that I have with it, um, it's, it feels like a, a, a place that's still very vibrant and creative, much more so than Miami is, or at least in the ways that I want to be creative and vibrant. I'm not saying Miami's boring, um, but, it's, but it's creative and vibrant, vibrant in a way that's not as appealing to me as, as New York. 
Uh, but a lot of people that I know who have been hired by this company have moved from various places, including New York and uh, from around the world, have gone down to Miami. Um, and, and I think that that's, I, I think there is a decentralization. I think that's good. Uh, I, I'm, I, I, I think it's good that people can work remotely in that and that you see, you're seeing other cities kind of um, embrace a creative class. But uh, uh, that's probably not what I'm supposed to be saying up here. <laughs> well, it's still, it's still the largest concentration of creatives, and it's the one place that they're still making more money than anywhere else. Hmm. So regardless of all the issues, and you know, it, it's still that core. Yeah. And that is the fact. So we are here because we can find the youngest people. We can hopefully raise them up and keep them. You know, we're investing them, so we want to keep them long term. And then if we have to get more people, they're, they're here. So. Um, it's still the capital. All right, that is going to be the last word. Thank you so much for a great conversation. Nasdaq Rossi, Anna Holmes, Carmen Wong, all rich. Thanks a lot. Please join me in welcoming NYC's Manoush Zamarodi and our next distinguished panel to the stage. Yay, there we go. That's what we were talking about. Hi, everybody. So nice to see you all. You've been a very quiet audience, and I don't know if that's because you were like with bated breath waiting for the wine bar to be open, <laughs> or if you were just listening very carefully. And I've seen there's been so many great comments on Twitter. So I do want to uh, encourage you, if you have a question, we're not gonna do a formal Q&A, but if you wanna hit me up with Twitter, that's why I have my phone up here, that's my excuse. Um, if there's something you want me to bring up that you feel like we're missing or whatever else there is, um, I am so honored to be included in this event. Thank you so much, Richard and Scott, for having me. If you don't know me, I host a show for New York Public Radio called New Tech City. It sort of got kicked off when the city was making this turn, as Richard described it, from being financial services oriented to technology oriented. And I think, um, you know, as Richard who said, every job in the future is a tech job. So. We certainly have seen that. And um, our show has grown from being just about New York City to being really a national show about how technology is changing all of our lives. So of course, I would love for you to check it out. Tell us your story, because we're looking for very personal stories about how tech is changing people's lives. Um, and I think on this last panel, we did hear some very personal stories, right? So what we want to do on our panel is sort of look um, a little bit more systemically, a little bit more from organizations, from community organizations, from academic organizations, and see very specifically with test cases what has worked, what hasn't worked, what can we scale, and where do we go from here. So let's be practical about this. Let's be pragmatic about this. We know the rent is too damn high, but <laughs> hey, we live here for a reason, right? Because it's awesome and amazing. So how are we going to make it work for all of us? Um, so I definitely want to introduce my panelists again. If you have it in your, your, for the full bios, Dr. Joyce Brown right here to my left, president of FIT. Juke Shu right there, founder of Coalition for Queens. Emily Wheeler, deputy director of NYC Acre and director of operations, Tower Bridge. New York, that's also with NYU, um, and Hank Williams, who's founder of Platform, among other things that he has done. So um, Joyce, I wanna start with you. This idea of academic institutions, there has been a big push. We, we know uh, Cornell is coming to Roosevelt Island. We have, SUNY has so many amazing programs. NYU, I feel like every minute I turn around, they've got a new sort of initiative going on. NYU Poly is really just, Mm -hmm. blowing up. What are some of the sort of cross collaborations that you see um, in terms of opportunities for academic institutions in the city? Is it changing? Is the role of an academic institution changing when it comes to how it works in the city and, and growing opportunities for people? Well, I think that um, a, a great deal of what we do at FIT really has to do with industry collaboration. I mean, it really has been the bedrock of uh, what, how our programs evolve. And we see the great success of that. All of our programs have internships associated with them. Um, you know, the students, uh, I always say the industry people come shopping. You know, they bring the kids in, they're very smart, they're very talented, it's very competitive. Um, and they bring them into their businesses and they um, infuse them with the culture, they teach them the ropes, and when they graduate, they hire them, you know? So we have, 
I mean, ours is really a success story. The four-year students, we probably have 90% of them are, are, have jobs at graduation, and 70% uh, of the two-year uh, graduates have, have jobs. So, so what is the role of academia? I mean, the role is to identify them, prepare them, give them what they need to be competitive, uh, create the opportunities, I think, for partnership. Um, and, and I think what we mean by partnership has probably changed over the years because there is such a, an eclectic, interdisciplinary diversity about what the marketplace really requires. So there's sort of a global context to what that exposure needs to be. Um, so it's far more than you know coming, having an academic program and then going out and hopefully finding a job. It's really, I think, um, when we talk about being pragmatic, uh, we really have an obligation to prepare students not only to be good citizens and to be well-educated and conversant in the issues of the day, but to be competitive in the marketplace and able to contribute uh, and um, demonstrate the value of of uh, what that experience has been. And I guess, you know, fashion is one of those things that has always been a, a great marriage of the very practical and the very sort of ethereal. There's, there, there, it's a hands-on sort of thing. Um, so do you think that there's some way that maybe they should, that other institutions could take lessons from industries that have figured out ways of marrying the two together? That I is it about the way that they set up their internships? Is it about the relationship that you have with industries? Is it, well, what else is it? I certainly think that it is. It has a lot to do with how we set up the internships. I mean, it is not you know go out and find a job and we'll give you a little credit or you know, mm -hmm. hours are for credit. They are not paid internships, and there is a a very specific and well defined relationship between the placement, between the workplace, between the employer and the mentor and the supervisor, and what is happening in the classroom. Uh, you know, so it's not a full time. You know, there's a give and take uh, where the one feeds off the other. Um, so I think, you know, th that definitely makes a difference and is a big part of our success. Uh, but I think the, the, the whole notion of, of partnership, if, if, if I can get more to the heart of your question, which Please. is, you know, how, how, how should those relationships be defined? Um, I think it really does have a lot to do with being focused in understanding the, the relationship that needs to develop between the full development of the, of the young person. It's not, it's not one or the other. I think that the, you know, in terms of fashion, in terms of the creative industries, you have these incredibly talented, I mean, you say ethereal, but it's more an aesthetic kind of passion that all these young people bring. I mean, they all tell you the same story. I've wanted to be here my whole life. You know, I've been sculpting and drawing and draping and sketching and you wanna see my scrapbook. I started it when I was three and I still have it and I'll show it to you. Um, and, <laughs> and they mean it, you know, they live it. And, and we've got to be able to take that and, and mold it in a way that it's meaningful beyond all that energy. So that, yes, it's a marriage of creativity and the business and the basic uh, finance and, and technical and all those other things that you need to channel all that energy and make it real. Um, otherwise, it's just cute, <laughs> you know, which isn't the idea. You know, they change the world by making beautiful things, but nevertheless, they change the world, and that's the part that we have to help mold for them. So Heather, from NYU's perspective, let's let's talk about some, I mean, I know when I went to visit Cornell myself, one of the key things they said as they were setting out was that we are going to have mentors from the top tech companies here and they are gonna be matched up with our incoming class, which was like, you know, 12 people or 15 or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And they are going to be part of the process year long. This is not about shipping them out there, you know, to do an internship. This is not about them coming in to do a one-off sort of presentation. This is about creating relationships. Can you sort yeah. of talk about what NYU is doing and what you specifically are doing at Acre? Yeah, so we do a number of different internship programs. I think that, you know, one of the more innovative ones that we do is actually through a work study program. I don't know how many people here who have, who have experienced work study, but for me it was working in a locker room in a gym and it was cleaning floors and doing laundry and things that like I really wasn't learning much other than I don't want to do this in the long term. <laughs> and um, 
And so what we're doing is through the work study program, we're matching students with tech startups because we have three incubators, two tech and one clean tech. So with tech and clean tech startups, and they're being paid by the university, but they're actually getting hands-on experience working for a startup, which teaches them a lot of things because at a small company, you're never just wearing one hat. And if you have somebody helping you out and you have an intern coming in who not only are they just a student intern willing to do anything, they also have really hard engineering skills and science skills. So they're doing coding, they're doing developing, they're doing you know, marketing, market research, all these different things. Um, so it's great for the startups, but it's also really great for the students. So they're getting this hands-on experience. And a lot of times they'll actually be offered full-time positions at the end. And so how do you match them up? Do, do you, is it sort of an organic thing that happens or do you sort of facilitate yeah, it? Yeah, there's a lot of facilitation that goes into it. And there's actually a lot of different programming that goes around it too. So um, we first kind of go to the startups and make sure that we can match a need. So whatever startups are actually looking to host an intern, they have to have a real project with real outcomes and real milestones. Um, and then we turn to the interns to do filtering and matching with skills. There's a short interview process as well. Um, throughout this whole entire program, there's training. So there's training for the students for also like how to write a resume and how to go look for a job once you graduate. And, um, and then there's actual hard skills training as well. So a number of our startups will say, you know, the interns that are coming out of the program or coming uh, through the program don't know how to code in like Ruby on Rails. And, you know, 90% of us are using that. So then we'll host a Ruby on Rails training for no cost for the students. Um, so we're, we're matching it up, there's some facilitation, and there's a lot of training that goes into it as well. So Jufe, I wanna ask you to jump in here. You and I were talking before the event about just, you know, coding, right? If you don't, you hear it how many times a day, right? Must learn to code, must learn to code, must learn to code. For those people who are not at a, you know, an NYU, Columbia, an FIT, what, and you, you have an unusual program that you've started yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> so I found this organization called Cold Shoes of Claim, and our mission is to foster the tech ecosystem in claim, particularly helping um, not only the tech companies, entrepreneurs that exist there, but also you know, low-income and minority communities participate in that process. And through our work, you know, the number one constraint to growth in tech companies that we hear day in and out is the lack of technical talent, right? And I think beyond the universities, you know, great universities like you know, Columbia and NYU and other schools here in New York, um, you know, we started thinking about are there other pathways that we can create into the tech sector um, so that people can both increase their incomes, gain the technical skills to get jobs, as well as help these companies grow. And in that way, you know, really bridge kind of the gap between what the tech sector is and, and, and the, the larger communities in claim. You know, I think, you know, what I love about Queens and about, I think everyone loves about New York is its incredible diversity. We have people from all over the world. You know, Queens is the I most Queens diverse. Queens is the most diverse, Yeah, right? Queens is the <laughs> most diverse place in the world. And if you look at the tech sector that's growing, you know, it's, unfortunately it's not the most diverse. You know, like, you know, 12% of the workforce are women. 1% of startup founders are African American or Hispanic. So as the tech scene grows in Queens, we want to make sure that's reflective of the, the diversity that's there and also the existing population that's there. Um, so we started this program last year called Access Code, um, where um, serving adults, teaching them how to code, um, specifically iOS, how to build mobile apps. And going through the program, most people have never coded before and teaching them enough so that people can build an app and with enough skill level to get a job in tech afterwards. And so, um, you know, we're 21 graduates, half women, half African American, Hispanic, 40% immigrants, reflective of the population of Queens. Um, what kind of job can they get? You can, yeah, afterwards, you can, uh, after you learn how to build a mobile app, you can become a mobile app developer. You know, work for, I mean, every company right now in New York um, or many industries want mobile apps and websites. And it's a technical skill that you can learn in a relatively short amount of time, you know, like three to six months, right? I think like computer science that's taught at NYU or at Columbia, um, you know, four-year college degree, you're learning algorithm, algorithms and data structures. Computer science is different from the skill level you need to build an app or a website. So there are actually multiple pathways to that. And even, you know, I was really fortunate, a lot of my classmates from Harvard are in tech now. Those that study computer science there, Actually, companies are hiring them more based off of the signaling that they can code, mm -hmm. and not necessarily based off of 
you know, do they know iOS or Ruby on Rails and these practical frameworks that companies are actually looking for? Because that's actually not, not what's taught at these colleges, right? So, uh -huh. so you can provide, you can teach folks that um, and, and help grow the tech industry. So our, our students, um, half the class also made under $15,000 a year originally. Average income was $26,000 a year. Uh, and now, after the program, average income is $73,000 a year. You know, people are getting hired full-time as mobile developers. And I think that really showcases one example of how you know, there are just extraordinary talented people out there. Um, we can open up the pathways to tech, help tech companies grow, and also help more New Yorkers. I think CUNY is a great example. You know, one way we started thinking about this was, you know, looking at Queens College, you know, we love Queens College. <laughs> it's in Queens, supports us. Queens College right now actually educates more computer science majors uh, than NYU and Columbia combined, the most in New York huh. City, right? As a, a huge pool of talent, but we see many of their graduates not going into tech, right? What do, what do they do? They're going to IT, you know, or, or some sort of other consulting. So why is there that gap there, right? And part of it is, I think this is something like Anna talked about earlier, is, you know, how, how do companies recruit? Yeah. You know, where, where do you think, you know, like, you know, traditionally tech companies look from, you know, Ivy League schools, where there's, there's models of success, right? If you're a commuter student that's going to Queens College or elsewhere in CUNY, even if you're really talented, you know, you may not, you know, understand the tech industry, right? The yeah. idea of raising a million, two million dollars in venture funding is, I mean, seems crazy to me, and, you know, I have friends doing it. I think it's even harder for someone that's, you know, working hard, first generation immigrant here in New York to pursue those opportunities. So what can we do in creating programming that better ties the existing tech industry with these pockets of talent? You know, CUNY, 400,000 students a year, right? I mean, if only even 1% of the students are extremely talented, I know a lot more are, they're just extraordinary people. Yeah. Like, we can really, you know, get more developers here in New York, open up the pathways for a creative class. And I think we were talking about, other people were talking about, everyone's really excited about the idea of Cornell and they're gonna train amazing master students in computer science, but we can't build enough you know, Cornells or, or other campuses to fill the need for what our current tech community in New York needs, but also I think how it's gonna to continue to grow. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So Hank, the diversity issue, that's what Platform is all about. Can you sort of explain the genesis of it and what you have found? Sure, so first of all, let me just, uh, I'm a black man in technology as a tech entrepreneur. So I feel a little bit like a unicorn. Uh, and uh, that's kind of what, what triggered me to found Platform. I have been in tech for 20 years uh, and uh, uh, started to realize that, I mean, I sort of realized it a little bit because I lived uh, uh, here in New York. I spent some time out in Silicon Valley and just realized just how bad the situation was nationwide and really founded Platform with the goal of figuring out how we could diversify uh, uh, the innovation economy. Um, I don't wanna re repeat uh, um, uh, some of the things that have already been said, but you know, 1% of, of uh, 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 tech entrepreneurs that raise money are, are black or, or Latino. Uh, another interesting statistic is that uh, 30,000 people last year took the AP uh, computer science exam. 20,000 of those were uh, passed it. Uh, 900 of those people that took the exam, 900 out of 30,000 were, were black, and 300 passed it. So 300 out of 20,000 passed the AP computer science exam. So the on-ramp into the, the sort of higher echelon uh, essentially does not exist for people of color in tech. It is, it is essentially zero. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's, it's a pretty scary and uh, uh, particular problem, particular, particularly when you consider that by, you know, we all know that, that by 20, sometime in 2040, 2050, the majority of this company will, country will be, will be minority. So one of the things that, that uh, uh, I've been focused on is what do, what do we do about this? How do we uh, uh, address this issue? And, and there is a whole sort of cohort of uh, small uh, uh, 
educational programs, things like uh, there's an organization called Black Girls Code, uh, 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 something called Smash Academy, created by uh, uh, Mitch Kapoor and Frida Kapoor. Mitch was the founder of Lotus 123. Uh, uh, and a whole, uh, maybe 30, 40, maybe even 50, you know, programs across the country. They are incredibly, incredibly underfunded. Uh, you know, a $500,000 grant is considered a lot for one of these organizations, and maybe they can service 200 kids or uh, 100 kids or whatever. Uh, and, and so we're not, uh, uh, but when they do, what we know is that, for example, if you look at, at Smash Academy, Level Playing Field Institute, they take kids, this is out in California, but they take kids that have a B average. They specifically won't take a kid with an A average but a kid with a B average in public school on free lunch, uh, a, a kid that, that is most likely would be a first generation college student that likely would not go to college, and they are taking these kids, and after three summers working with them for five or six weeks, along with support during the year, they're turning these kids into, uh, 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 they're getting these kids into MIT, into Stanford, into Harvard, and the program has been going on for 10 years, so we know, and, and they're now coming out, graduating, and becoming enormously successful. These kids in, in, the in that particular program, they basically invest $10,000 in a kid, and that's the outcome, from a kid that was almost certainly not going to go to college to a kid that's now graduating from an engineering school and is going out into the world and, and being successful, and these are not, are not A students. So what we know, is that uh, you know, Facebook just acquired uh, a company called WhatsApp for $19 billion. If you think about taking 100,000 kids, which would, 10,000 kids a year, uh, uh, you could make that a, a half, and, and, and supporting 100,000 kids or 10,000 kids a year uh, over 10 years, you could, uh, you could uh, uh, essentially make, create a pool that was that matched where the demographics will be uh, uh, in terms of, of the population so that it could be five or 10,000 of those 20,000 kids passing that are from groups that right now make up 1% of, of, the, of the, the computer science pool. So the, the, the basic point is that, that with a, an infinitesimally small amount of money from, from government, from private industry, from, uh, 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 from wherever, uh, I, I'm at this point, I think given the politics in the, the country, it's more likely to come from private support, but collectively, we've got to invest in these kids because if we don't, the, 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 pol the potential for social, political unrest when you've got uh, uh, essentially no one participating in the most important part of the economy, it's scary. So we should all be worried about so that. So tell us, I, I'm, I'm worried, but so tell me, like, I am, for real. So tell me what platform is doing then. Like, I know so, that you give a voice to a lot of diverse yeah. people. Is so, that? Well, so we started with the idea just in the very beginning of just uh, uh, creating a conference, just to bring people together to talk about the issue and to highlight people from underrepresented communities just so they could get on stage. Uh, brilliant uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, technologists, et cetera, uh, because if you're a, for example, Latina kid from El Barrio, you may never have seen someone that looks like you getting on stage and talking and demonstrating that, that you could do this work too. So we started there, but um, what, where we're, and, and we, we, we did that conference last year, we're doing it, it's an annual event that's basically a TED-like event, if you're familiar with TED. But uh, that's sort of part of our work now, but the other part of our work, and the reason I talk about the, the, the educational stuff, is because what we're now doing is trying to coalesce the community to actually galvanize those resources, because there's, it's one thing to create the motivation and the belief that you can do, but at the end of the day, there's not just got to be a belief that you can do it, but financial support to, to behind you, because uh, uh, you know, hope is great, but hope without, you know, some resources is, is nothing. So that's why I really start with, with the resources, and that's one of the, the things that we are sort of laser focused on. We want to create the, the belief that you can succeed and also give you the resources to succeed. 
And I'd love to know from the panelists, do you think that that is improving in terms of getting the private sector to realize their responsibility? Google last month announced that it was giving $50 million uh, to girls, getting more girls to code. They're giving it to nonprofit organizations and also starting their own sort of marketing initiative. Um, I have visited the Academy of Software Engineering, the first high school in Manhattan that is being funded by Union Square Ventures and getting money from Facebook, actually. I mean, you know, something like a little high school in Manhattan, that's pretty small. How do we start to scale this? Is it sort of, is it built into like, that is your responsibility in the community? How do we, when I visited Google, I guess it was like a year and a half ago, they were like, we really wanna be part of the New York community. And we've seen that in some ways, but they also sort of keep themselves to themselves. So how do we make it so that it's not just the smaller companies who don't have the money to support this stuff, but it's the big guys who realize they have a huge responsibility here? So I think, you know, I think these are all great questions. And I think, um, you know, Hank talked, you know, very, very well about the need for increasing diversity in tech. Um, I think there are some shifting winds and people understand that this is an important issue. Um, and I think that's a great role for the comptroller and the city to play in convening both uh, corporate entities as well as philanthropy, um, as well as the city to kind of think about how to shape these policies. Um, I, I do want to kind of add on to what Hank was saying also and, and kind of distinguish. I think it's, I think a lot of focus also has been on K to 12 education. Mm -hmm and there's been a lot of resources poured into that, and I think that's really important in kind of creating the next generation of, of leaders and people in tech. But for adults, I think that's a huge gap, and there's actually been very, very little focus on workforce development for software you know, development. Do you mean like mid-career adults? Mid-career or, or in, their, in, their, in their 20s, right? Uh -huh. Most of it's focused on high school and getting into, you have great success stories of people going to elite institutions again, right? But if we really want to open the pathways, right, some, you know, 65% of New Yorkers don't have college degrees, right? How do we get more New Yorkers without college degrees or at community colleges with these skills so they can participate as every job is becoming more technology enabled? And in the context of urban, if we're talking about New York City and the urban neighborhoods, um, I think it's really, you know, for K to 12, you're kind of, you know, helping um, the problem in the future, but, if we're talking about gentrification and tech companies growing very rapidly in certain neighborhoods, what about now. the people there now and in those communities so they don't feel pushed out of that process, right? I think a lot of cities have, ha have had successful tech of economic development strategies, like San Francisco gave Twitter and other companies tax breaks to move mm -hmm. to mid-market. Huge backlash against tech there for a number of reasons, I think. But if you're able to show folks in the existing community give them skills and they're able to participate in that process, there would be less of that tension there. You know, what is it in the urban context there, right? Mm -hmm. As New York's tech community grows, or you know, we're very excited in Queens, as Queens' is tech community grow, and also Cornell's building Rose Island is gonna affect Western Queens, you know, how is that gonna affect the existing communities there? You know, large concentration of public housing, Queens Bridge, Golden Bridge, Astoria houses, a lot of manufacturing space, you know, is that gonna be seen as a, uh, as, as tech pushing out existing residents, or can we provide pathways for those that exist there for adults to participate and make people feel included in that process? I think that some of the um, colleges, I mean, you talk about CUNY, and certainly uh, at FIT we have a, a limited um, effort, but nevertheless an important one in terms of continuing education and professional development for people. So I think you see you know, these various courses, for, uh, for example, we have an enterprise center, what we call an enterprise center, and we offer, um, you know, computer skills. We go to financial skills, business plan kinds of things. So it's probably, you know, certainly not enough to capture uh, a whole generation of people that obviously need that sort of intervention, but it is what those institutions can do. I think when you talk about um, businesses, I think we have to be practical and, and recognize there's gotta be a bottom line return, no matter that you know, it might, from a philanthropic point of view, be the sort of social uh, intervention that they ought to do. At the end of the day, they've really gotta balance it. And I think the message needs to be, it is in the interest of the industries of this country uh, to ensure that we have a, a skilled set 
of a middle class of people that are able to uh, be the thought leaders as well as the hands-on people to keep the businesses going. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, how do you do that? I think that there's opportunities for partnerships to be developed and for people to really understand that that, um, that early intervention, you talk about K through 12, you can, you know, you can really create, I think, all the way up the food chain, uh, you know, opportunities for partnership, for intervention. Uh, we have, for example, right now, a program that we've been doing, and it's called Designers as, as Entrepreneurs. You talk about the government. I think the city has really made an attempt to marry that, um, the, the, the energy and the talent that exists in the creative communities with the technical and the business direction that is happening, I think, across the board in industry. And so we have something called Designers as Entrepreneurs. So you take young um, creatives that have a business that are moderately successful. You know, we're talking, you know, it sounds like a lot of money if you're not in business, but say a couple of million dollar business. So they've, they've had their scars, they've made some success, but they really can't get beyond that. And we marry them with business people, uh, businesses who understand that these are folks that may be creative but don't ha know how to do a business plan. You know, you talk about examples. We had, you know, one young woman who, whose designs were worn on stage by names of people you would recognize but had no client base, so really couldn't get uh, loans to advance the business. Through this program and through being uh, exposed to the ins and outs of technical expertise, finance, doing a business plan, she was able to um, do a business plan, get a loan, have a whole diffusion line that allowed her to get into um, the market and, and demonstrate that she could be a success. So it's, it's various levels that I think we can make the case uh, for businesses to intervene and to understand that there's something in it uh, for them to continue New York as the creative capital that it really ought to be. And the one, I, I also feel like it's very much the soft technical skills as well as the hard technical sure. skills. I mean, I took a, oh, sorry. I took a one day coding mm -hmm. class. I was terrible at it, like awful terrible. But I realized that I, what I gained was the ability to have a conversation with some of right. these coders. Like other, I can now, I sort of get the thinking process and I think that is, some people you are like, oh. You know what you don't know. Exactly, you know what you don't know and you know how to then communicate what you need to have happen. Right. So um, Senior Planet is a place also that I find very interesting. It's um, a nonprofit for seniors that, you know, it's not gonna teach them how to code, but it's gonna teach them how to make an online resume, how to use email better, how to get those soft skills so they can go out and get a job because so much of getting a job these days is about self-branding, right? And marketing mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I sort of wonder how much of the soft skills are important, not just the, you know, Ruby on Rails. Well, I, I think soft skills are, are hugely important, but I just wanted to touch on the, the, the question that you were asked a second ago about, about uh, businesses in New York City. So. Uh, the financial community is as big or almost as big as the tech community in terms of hiring talent. And that's sort of an interesting thing in terms of, of New York City. And it's particularly interesting because this has been convened by the controller's office. And so there is certainly an opportunity to convene. A and by the way, so I mean, I'm not gonna name names, but I'm having dialogues with all of these guys and they, the, the leaders inside some of these big financial companies, and they get it. It's not like they don't understand, but, but there is an enormous value to just organizing and focusing people and creating the framework that allows them to act, because they do get it. I don't think that any of these guys are going, oh, it doesn't really matter that the you know, New York workforce is not exactly what we want or that there isn't enough, they get it. So we just gotta figure out how to, how to, how to marshal that, and I do think that that that's a, 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 a role that, uh, you know, even if the government can't write the biggest and all of the checks, they can convene, and particularly the controller's office can, ha can, can add some significant value there. I mean, FinTech, I think we, we've seen that that is the biggest sector of tech right now that's taking off in New York City. What about clean tech, though, Heather? I mean, that is like sort of like 
the, in the industry that it's like, why isn't it happening? Why hasn't it happened? Right. Where do you see that going? Because that seems like a, an amazing place for opportunity here. Absolutely, absolutely. So clean tech is definitely growing in the city, uh, maybe a lot, a lot slower than some of the other tech sectors. But um, a lot of what we do is looking to New York City to bring in the talent pool. So I'm actually, we're constantly getting people in from the financial sector who have backgrounds in law, who have backgrounds in a number of different things. Um, and they want to they want to make a difference, right? Like that's I think that's what draws that's what drew me to clean tech. I think that's what draws a lot of people to clean tech is you have a passion for the environment and you have a passion for making a difference. So a lot of what we do is one growing the community. So we look to other communities hosting events and meetups and hackathons and you name it to try to bring more people in and focus on clean tech and and kind of um, help us grow this this community. But then the other thing that we're doing is we're we're working to enable. Um, different communities to have access to clean tech technology. So uh, we do a K through 12 STEM program at NYU. Um, our clean tech incubator participates in it. Every summer there's a Science of Smarter Cities program where we're teaching kids um, in middle school about the really complex clean tech technologies that our companies are working on. We break it down to a level where anybody can understand it and these these eighth graders are coming up with great ideas and they're they're taking the little bit that they learn and they're, you know, they're teaching our entrepreneurs some things. So it's great. And then there's another program that we host um, in our space called Green City Force. And what they're doing is they're, like you mentioned, they're taking, it's not the K through 12, it's after that. So they're taking, um, they're taking young adults who are uh, come from these underprivileged communities and they're, they're teaching them real skills, hands-on skills that they can use to bring these energy efficient technologies to their neighborhood. So whether it's doing energy audits or painting roofs white or s installing solar, or doing efficiency upgrades, um, they have the skills, they're bringing them to their neighborhoods, they're ha they get jobs after and they're actually making a difference too. Um, and then we actually have companies within our incubator who are hiring them as well. So we're trying to like come full circle and really bring these technologies to people who wouldn't uh, normally be exposed to them. We only have a few minutes left and I would be remiss not to touch on something that really has not come up yet, which is the sharing economy and where that sort of fits into our conversation going forward. And I'm referring to Airbnb, I'm referring to Lyft and Uber. We have seen that the New York city and state legislation has been reluctant to sort of make it possible for these companies to, or there's been resistance. How important do you think that is to some of the people who are disenfranchised in this city? We, you, you've seen all those posters, right, on the subway platform, the woman in Fort Greene who does Airbnb and is therefore able to stay in New York City. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I, we, I certainly know how Airbnb feels about this. They like to call us very often, but I'm curious to know where you guys think where it fits in terms of the city and the politicians and, and where they need to go with this this fight. Yeah, it's one of those things that it, it obviously cuts both ways. Right now, there's so, like Uber <coughs> is paying more for a taxi driver than you pay with the Uber X. Uh, uh, you know, they're paying the drivers more money than uh, than the driver actually takes in from the than they're they're taking in from the the clients. There was this enormous enormous a billion dollars, I think, in Uber or something like that, uh, of venture capital going into these companies. So we don't really know right now what the, the, the economics of, of a system when it, it's operating at equilibrium looks like. So it's really hard to say where these things are gonna go because it's all distorted. I mean, and maybe it'll be a, 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 a great thing and there's differences between each of these companies, but you know, Uber's the one that's been most in the news, Airbnb a little bit because they're, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the fights with the, the attorney general here in the city. But, but uh, it, it's not entirely clear, I mean, it really depends on the company, but I don't think it's entirely clear uh, that, that Uber is, in that particular case, is or is not beneficial to regular people. I think there's also the, the benefit, the beneficial side to the collaborative consumption or the sharing economy that people don't always think about. I mean, the like basic idea is like, if I own a drill and you need a drill, why would you go buy another drill when you could just borrow mine? And, and so the idea of not using resources over and over again when you only use your drill like maybe twice a year. Um, we have one company within our incubator called Bandwagon and they are part of this whole ride sharing initiative, but what they do is they, they facilitate ride sharing. So rather than an Uber that just 
comes and pick you, picks you up and takes you to your destination, their, their software can see where maybe I can pick you up, but Hank is on the way to where you're going and he also needs a ride. So now we only have one car going there instead of two, so that's less CO2 emissions, that's less traffic, that's less cars on the road. So there's a lot of uh, potential environmental benefits, benefits for the city, and um, so th I think there's that side of it to, that's important as well. But then what happens yeah. if there's less cars being made, then how does that impact the auto industry? The, and those <laughs> jobs. Or less taxi that's our drivers future, and That's like Uber's whole thing, right? It, it like just gets so complicated. Right. <laughs> but it's not a bad thing. What do you think? I just, uh, your yeah, so, brain right. is like on fire so, right now. <laughs> I can see it. I, I, think, I think for New York City to remain a leader of innovation and technology, we have to have the policies that are supportive of the sharing economy. Um, I think we're only at the beginnings of that right now. And I'm a little biased. Long, Uber's New York City headquarters in Lawrence City, Queens. So <laughs> very supportive. And Josh, the New York City manager from Forest Hills, I was in the Lyft launch video this past week. So uh, obviously Don't very supportive. Him, but 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 I, I do think um, there, there's going to continue to be more innovation. Um, we're just at the very beginning. And I think a lot of these companies, and I do understand the need to protect consumers, and have other areas, but it does tackle a lot of these other challenges we're thinking about. You know, everyone was talking earlier about transportation and how difficult it is to create this infrastructure. Well, Lyft and Uber and Bandwagon kind of um, provides opportunities to try to solve those challenges. And I think, you know, Uber's only been in existence for five years. You know, that's, that's pretty crazy, right? You know, like five years raised $1.2 billion in this last round. And so, as a sharing economy, I, I, I would say that we shouldn't think about what Uber is now or Lyft is now, but about what these things could be. And I think it's really, really important to have the right political climate here so that people aren't afraid to create companies and innovate and create disruptive industries that's not gonna make the real estate industry happy or gonna make other existing companies and industries here happy. And that's a fine balance to have. But you know, if we're talking about pathways to the middle class in New York as a leader, we need to make sure that that's not closed off for companies and entrepreneurs. It's so interesting. I, my, I have a first grader, and I they had they were running a post office for the entire year at their elementary school. How does a post office work? How do you sort it, etc. So I went and I told them the story of a startup called Outbox that wanted to it would take your mail, scan it, and then post it online for you, so you wouldn't actually have any mail. And I told them the story about the startup, and they just looked horrified. They were like, oh, no real mail? You know, who would touch it? I want to touch my mail. And then they sort of sat there, and they were like, well, then the postman could spend more time with his family. <laughs> and we wouldn't waste as much paper. And it was like the thought process that happened within sort of 10 minutes. And that I feel like that's such a like microcosm of what is sort of going on in our, in our city. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because I was thinking um, that it is a microcosm. You, look, you talk about the sharing economy. I always say that whatever, whatever we're discussing and whatever problem needs to be solved, we really need a 20-something in the room because there's a, there's a whole different thought process. There's a different approach. There's a, there's a different um, expectation uh, for w what the variables are in this equation. And so, you know, I think we're just at the beginning of all of the things that are going to change about what the economy looks like, what the city looks like. And the challenge, and I think what we're really here talking about, is how we make it inclusive and possible for it to develop with everybody having an opportunity to contribute. And I don't think we can predict what, the, what it's ultimately going to look like or what the mechanisms are going to be for how we get things done. It's, I mean, I think we should just sort of, you know, keep fueling the fire and hang on for the ride because I don't think we know. I, I don't think business as usual, I mean, when you think about it, we are not entertained in the same way, we don't get information the same way, we don't communicate the same way as we did. I mean, I'm using we in the great universal sense since, you know, there's all ages represented. But, you know, many of us have had different sets of expect, uh, of experiences than young people today have. And so I think the solutions are yet to be defined. And um, how we get transported is just one example. How the mail is going to really, uh, what, it, what mail is going to mean is, is just another example. So 
Okay, so we leave you on that disruptive and exciting note. Thank you so much for having all of us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. So I realize that I'm standing between you all and wine, but really quickly, I just want to, uh, my name is Stephen Pettigo. I'm the director of the new initiative for creativity and, and cities here at NYU. And I just want to thank our panelists and all of our speakers, as well as the comptroller's office for joining us today. I'd encourage you, if you'd like to learn more about the work that we're doing uh, at our new initiative, our website address is on these two banners here. Take a look at the work, the, the programs, the curriculum that we'll be building. We hope many of you will be interested. So please, thank you for coming. Enjoy the, the wine, the treats, and we'll talk to you soon. Many thanks. <laughs>